Hi, uh, Jonathan. Good to see you. You too. Okay, let's wait for one more minute and then we are ready to go. Okay. How was the espresso, Dario? <laughs> it was good. It was good. And actually, I realize it takes me really literally five minutes to prepare an espresso. So. Okay. And the rest of the time is thinking about it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Very no, good. It's, it's yeah. more that there's a sort of ritual. You know, you have to grind beans. You have to check for exact quantity. Also, the exact pressure of the machine. I mean, if you want good, I don't really drink too many coffees, but um, those I drink, they have to be good. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, now it's 4.30, so I would say just for the sake of the time, it's better if we uh, uh, start. I welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Dario. I, I work with Giles at the Roosevelt Institute for American Studies, uh, and I will be uh, chairing the first two uh, panels for this conference. I really wanted to uh, uh, thank you all for your kind uh, participation and for your very interesting and engaging papers. Uh, the first two uh, speakers or actually the first speaker and the first commentator that we have uh, today are uh, Jonathan uh, Chilcote, I hope I Chilcote, pronounce Chilcote, yeah, that's close enough. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, and uh, um, Jonathan will be presenting a paper titled uh, Beyond Control of Local Authorities, the Spanish Influenza Epidemic and Federal Supervision of Public Health. Jonathan teaches history and political science at Florida College in the United States, and his research focuses precisely on that, on, on the... Uh, uh, influenza epidemic of 1918 and its broader impact on the federal uh, government. Uh, our first commentator uh, today is going to be uh, Simon Toner uh, from the University of Sheffield. Welcome, Sa Simon. Uh, Simon specializes on the history of the United States in global and, trans and transnational perspective. Uh, uh, Simon has also published extensively on the U.S. relations with the Global South, uh, on modern Vietnamese history, on global development, war and counterinsurgency, and political economy. It's a great pleasure to have both of you here. So without further ado, I would first give the floor to Jonathan and then to Simon. Ten minutes each so that then we can have like good 20 minutes of collective conversation. Thank you. Oh, thank you, and thank uh, you for the invitation. It's nice to be assembled with people of uh, uh, like academic interest. Uh, there is not as many people uh, that were interested in this topic, but as the uh, keynote speaker mentioned, it's become quite a bit more uh, crowded, but it's nice to speak with people who have dedicated so much time to studying this topic. Uh, my paper looks at some of the changes that has been brought on by the influ uh, Spanish influenza epidemic. Uh, it's sometimes a little bit challenging to look at that epidemic and recognize anything concrete or immediate in terms of changes. And so that way it can be a little bit uh, frustrating when you're looking at it because you expect something that was so powerful and so pervasive to have some sort of direct impact or changes. Uh, you know, people tend to think it's almost going to be like the Black Death in terms of the huge societal uh, disruption that it causes. Uh, but I believe that there are some long term effects based in some ways on how the government, uh, the different levels of American government responded to it. Because one thing that you notice is not just during the epidemic, but into the 20s and in the 30s too, references to Spanish influenza abound among American policymakers, especially among politicians and public health officials. And I believe that the Spanish influenza epidemic and the government response to it helped establish trust and credibility for the federal government and the public health service or the primary arm of the uh, federal government and health public health work and those two things the trust and credibility allowed the expansion of federal oversight of public health going forward um, as you're probably aware spanish influenza reached into almost every aspect of american life it killed thousands ultimately hundreds of thousands of people during 1918 and 1919 it began really uh, an impact in terms of the East Coast, but it spread throughout the entire country. But one thing that we know is that state and local health efforts to stop it failed. Uh, 
they certainly tried. Uh, they lacked the staff, the resources, and the governmental support to do much of anything uh, in terms of stopping it. And, and even if they could, uh, they lacked jurisdiction because the boundaries in places by either state lines or city lines prevented them from going and dealing with something, uh, even though it might have been just outside their borders. The Spanish influenza epidemic was a true public health crisis. Uh, it certainly affected thousands, if not millions of people, but it also exposed the lack of coordination among public health branches. And we cannot separate the uh, Spanish influenza from the Great War, of course, had a huge role in this. And the United States was suffering problems because of influenza in, the, in industries, in military, and in general, this disease threatened the United States' capacity to wage war as well as endangering American citizens at the same time. And the U.S. saw directly that epidemics could be disruptive and ultimately devastating during wars. And the Spanish influenza epidemic displayed the need for coordinated responses, not just to this epidemic, but to future ones as well. All of this led the federal government to act. Although the depth of their actions were not fully understood at the time, in late September 1918, Congress hastily passed after a two hour debate, uh, they passed it by unanimous resolution, a, a new uh, resolution to allocate a million dollars to the public health service as, uh, as well as giving it the authority to organize and coordinate a multi-layered governmental response. Uh, the actual amount of money probably isn't the biggest aspect of this. Uh, it's a million dollars. Uh, it's. In 1918 alone, the Public Health Service got $2 million to study venereal diseases. Uh, their total budget for 1918 was, I think, $50 million. So $1 million toward Spanish flu was not the major part. What was the major part was the authority to organize and to, in essence, uh, allow them to compel state and local health departments to work with them. And I think that resolution had long-term consequences far and away beyond what Congress was intending, which was the, the suppression of influenza. Uh, the Public Health Service has been around since the John Adams administration, late 18th century. Uh, it mainly dealt with sick seamen. Uh, during the 19th century, it assumed more power to enforce quarantines, uh, to study some certain diseases. Uh, it had other duties that it picked up throughout the 19th century. But by the end of that century, most public health work was still the responsibility of state and local governments. Uh, there was some voluntary cooperation early 20th century. There was some talk of a new federal organization that would oversee all public health coming out of the spirit of the progressive era, but nothing was ever created. The federal government in the early 20th century did not control or oversee much of the nation's public health efforts. Now though, the public health service was given the funding and the directive and authority to compel state and local health groups to cooperate with them. And the government recognized uh, directly that they were challenging what had been the pre preeminent model, which was sort of autonomy of state and local groups uh, based upon constitutional authority for public health efforts. And so they now had the ability to compel these groups to work with them. The interesting thing is they didn't need to. Uh, these state and local health boards were desperate for assistance, they were desperate for resources, uh, and they willingly submitted to federal oversight. Uh, in order to expand their numbers and to reduce uh, overlap of jobs, the Public Health Service actually began hiring the state and local public health officials, uh, putting them on the federal payroll. Uh, and by doing so, by the end of the epidemic, many of the, of the country's public health officials were at least quasi-public officials, uh, quasi-federal officials on federal payrolls. All of this established trust and connections with the Public Health Service across all layers of government. After the fall wave of influenza subsided, the Public Health Service was lauded for their work and the seeming success of being able to stop influenza. And many groups in states, localities, even private citizens, began lobbying Congress to maintain the Public Health Service in this new working model where the Public Health Service and the federal government would be in charge of things. Federal officials, too, came to believe that such a model of cooperation could protect the nation from future health crises. And the support for this was vast. Uh, I think you can see it even in when Warren G. Harding comes into the presidency on his return to normalcy. We oftentimes think about how he was going to slash government spending and the progressive era and those type of things. His platform included, though, a call for the federal government to provide maternal and child care. Uh, and 
that was something that was, uh, you know, an expansion of federal power, even though the progressive era was winding down at that point. That would pass in 1921 with the Shepherd Towner Act, and that gave the Public Health Service the ability to pick uh, state grants recipients and oversee how public health money given by the federal government was going to be spent in states and local governments. Other acts uh, enlarged the public health service's power and the ability to oversee and control lower levels of public health efforts. But there was this recognition that the federal government, because of the changing world and the devastating nature of epidemics, uh, that they needed to coordinate and oversee the nation's public health efforts. The federal government now saw itself as vital to the system, and through the public health service, it would serve as a supervisor of future health programs. And so part of the legacy of Spanish influenza and the epidemic, as well as the problems that it causes to American society, uh, they loomed large in policymakers' minds. The epidemic had displayed the inadequacy of state and local health efforts above and beyond any deficiencies that had been recognized before, because they just couldn't muster the resources or co coordinate efforts effectively enough to deal with the epidemic. So the federal government stepped in, and the congressional resolution that was passed ended up having a much longer impact than just suppressing Spanish influenza. It gave the federal government and the public health service credibility, and the federal government recognized how coordination between levels of government could make public health more efficient. And in debates over public health in the 1920s and in the 1930s, Spanish flu is repeatedly referenced as a demonstration as to why coordination was necessary and an example of the de destruction epidemics could cause if cooperation and federal control were not accepted. Spanish influenza and the government's response to it set the model for what would be, would be the federal, state, and local cooperation going forward. And from that point on, really, you're going to see a trend where the public health service and the federal government began exercising oversight, so much so that by our own day and age, it's just a commonly accepted thing. The federal government will kind of sit on top of that relationship uh, between state and local and the federal public health agencies all working together. Uh, I think I'll go ahead and just stop it there, but uh, thank you for listening. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Jonathan, especially for being precisely on time. This is really appreciated. Uh, so Simon, please, the uh, floor is yours. Okay, uh, you can hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, okay, great. Uh, thank you, Dario, and thank you, Jonathan, for a really thought-provoking paper. So, um, uh, Jonathan is telling a story here of how national interests and public health overlapped in World War I uh, United States. So, he highlights how the Spanish flu had this potential to disrupt the war effort by disrupting, among other things, industrial production and even the U.S. military offensives on the Western Front. And he shows that at the beginning of World War I, and even, even by 1918, the US had a relatively weak public health infrastructure, which was largely in the hands of state and local governments, um, while the federal public health services seemed to focus primarily on research and a select number of hygiene and disease eradication campaigns. And he, he also points out that this weak public health infrastructure was, was further weakened during the war uh, because many medical personnel volunteered for military assignments while the US Public Health Service focused on the health of the armed forces. So essentially the US does not have the capacity to deal with an epidemic when it breaks out in 1918. And that is the reason why Congress responds, right? And as Jonathan said there, the most significant uh, part of this is not the, the funds that are appropriated, but the, the authority that is granted to the public health service to coordinate, uh, uh, to lead the effort and to coordinate the effort to control the disease. And he points out that influenza itself in the end did not greatly threaten the war effort as was imagined, but the response to this perceived threat had a lasting legacy. Um, so essentially, this is the story of how the U.S. had to overhaul and strengthen its public health infrastructure in the face of epidemic disease in wartime with sort of lasting consequences for uh, uh, the federal role in public health. So I have a few questions for Jonathan. Um, he shows this kind of interesting uh, paradox, maybe, uh, that... Uh, a number, as he points out, a number of other federal agencies were created uh, 
during the war, uh, but were abolished uh, very soon thereafter, whereas public health services uh, grew. So Jonathan's talking here about the tremendous growth in the scope and capacity of the federal state during World War I. There were many new agencies created, such as the War Industries Board, which coordinated industrial production, um, it set quotas, allocated raw materials, fixed prices, these kinds of things. The National Labour Board, which was mainly a kind of a bid to de-radicalize workers and to prevent industrial unrest in wartime, uh, which created a kind of a mechanism for bargaining between workers and employers. Um, and as Jonathan points out, these agencies and other similar ones were abolished after the war, shortly after the war, but public health services survives and grows. And in this sense, Jonathan suggests that there is that public health services might be a kind of a bridge between the progressive and the New Deal eras. But I wonder what explains uh, this persistence of public health services uh, beyond, uh, well, you, you suggest that it is uh, largely in recognition that public health and national interests overlapped and that ep epidemic control was necessary to project American power. So this explains the persistence of public health services um, after the war or the growth, I should say. But arguably some of those other wartime agencies um, were also in the national interest and helped project US power, uh, at least during the war. So why, why are public health services expanded? Whereas things like the War Industries Board and the National Labour Board, which actually led to big increases in industrial production and kind of helped secure social peace during the war. Why are they disbanded? Um, but one thing I thought was interesting in your comments there that didn't come out to me as much in the paper itself was this idea of trust and credibility, which I think you, you should really explore more as a kind of a category of analysis. I think that would be really interesting. But I, I was wondering if there are other reasons why um, these wartime agencies are abolished and public health services expanded. Of course, uh, it might be because these wartime agencies uh, were in response to specific wartime needs, whereas public health services, of course, is, is not a specific creation of the war, unlike some of these other ones. Um, but it's also true that some of these wartime services were regulatory agencies, which especially regulated the economy and labor and the allocation of resources. And I was struck by a kind of free trade argument that was made it, at one point in your paper. You suggest that at least some supporters of the expansion of federal power in public health thought that it was necessary in an era of increased commerce and communication. Um, so in, in some sense, is this uh, calling for um, an expansion of federal power in order to protect commerce, whereas some of these other wartime agencies were actually about regulating commerce and perhaps this is about the kind of end of the progressive era and this inclination to regulate industry. Uh, public health services is maybe facilitating uh, an expansion in commerce, whereas those other agencies are regulating it. I don't know, that was just a question I had for you uh, about, about the, 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 the growth of public health services and the abolition of these other agencies. The second question that I had is on the role of um, private and especially philanthropic organizations. So obviously the 19 teens is the era of the Rockefeller Foundation's Sanitary Commission uh, for the Eradication of Hookworm in the American South. And I was struck by the similarity in, in terms of what public health services are doing prior to World War I. You said it was primarily laboratory research, health and hygiene campaigns. Um, it was working on hookworm in the American South. So what was the relationship between the Rockefeller Commission and public health services? Um, to what extent were public health services able to use the networks that had been established by the Rockefeller uh, Commission? And then the, uh, the, other, the other thing that I think is interesting about this is at the time the public health services expands, that's when the Rockefeller Sanitary Commission turns outwards and launches the International Health Division, right? And starts focusing on disease eradication in Latin America and the British Empire. So is this, uh, uh, is this expansion of Rockefeller projects abroad facilitated by public health services assumption of uh, greater responsibility domestically? Um, uh, and so 
in in that sense, uh, public health services would, would be sort of facilitating uh, this growth of international power. Because uh, I mean, as I see it, the International Health Division uh, of the Rockefeller Foundation is really one of the leading edges of of U.S. international development. Right. That that takes on such a big role after 1945. So I was wondering what the relationship with public health services and Rockefeller is there. Um, and then, and then the 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 other the final question I have I think goes back to this issue of trust and credibility. One one of the things that you um, really compellingly uh, suggest is that part of the reason why the growth of a, a federal role in public health was accepted at the state and local level and by ordinary citizens was because of this. Um, um, acknowledgement or acceptance that it would, public health was vital to national interests. And you even show how uh, the uh, uh, con Congress's uh, expansion of public health services after World War I is actually in response to kind of bottom up pressures, right? Like petitions and things like that. So I guess going back to Giles's comments at the opening of the conference, what does that tell us about the COVID era? If you would be interested in addressing that, I wonder. Um, when it seems there's obviously significantly greater tension between federal uh, and state authorities, or at least between different authorities at the local level about responding to uh, the pandemic. So I'm thinking, for example, of uh, like states blocking school districts, vaccine or mask mandates and things like that. So I wonder, that's a big question, obviously, but I just wonder if your story has anything to tell us about that. Okay, well, I'll start, I'll start at the beginning there. Uh, forgive me if I don't remember uh all the necessary elements that you were talking about. Uh, your question about why the public health service kind of survives and public health works kind of goes while so many other things uh, are pushed to the wayside. I, I think you're, a part of it is right that it had pre-existed a number of those regulatory boards and things like that that were there. Also, I, I see much more of a domestic focus. Uh, people had direct experience with, the, with health issues. Uh, far and beyond what maybe the uh, War Industries Board would have done for most average everyday Americans. Uh, it, Spanish influenza touched their lives in such a way uh, that they don't probably get from other things, or at least uh, uh, unknowingly, they don't understand how those things are touching them. I, I think, too, that public health has a tremendous amount of Republican backers, which we oftentimes get lost in the story of Republican and Democrat. You know, the Democrats and Wilson are more progressive, and, and then the Republicans come out and come in and they sort of clean house. Uh, there is this sense that a lot of Republicans are actually backers, and sort of the in the more of the Teddy Roosevelt mold in terms of public health and things like that, that they have a little more influence. Uh, also, I would say that uh, the public health service and public officials, public health officials across all layers, are tremendous lobbyists. Uh, if you go back in the records in the early 1919, they're writing letters to themselves and they're saying, let's take advantage of this. We're going to spread the gospel of, of public health. In fact, they use that phrase, the gospel of public health. And we're going to use this. And they try to use the next possible bill that goes through Congress in 1919 about rural sanitation to push immediately for this enlarged uh, role for the public health service. It doesn't work. But they're immediately like looking for opportunities and they're coordinating. In fact, uh, there is a state health director, I think he's from North Carolina, that's writing to all the other state health directors saying, let's make sure we're on the same page with this. Let's coordinate the language that we're sending to petitions to Congress about this. Uh, they're working together, so unified. Uh, the other thing I think that makes a big difference is the war itself when it ended and the care for veterans that had to come back. Uh, there was not a really embodied sort of veterans care programs. So the United States is left scrambling, thinking, what are we going to do with all these wounded uh, uh, veterans that need care for? Like, how are we going to provide for them? And the easiest solution they have is, OK, which federal wing sort of deals with health issues? That's the public health service. So the public health service is thought of as being not something that can easily be kind of pushed aside because of veterans care. And in fact, the public health service is give, given oversight of veterans care. They fail miserably in the job. Uh, they do such a bad job that by, I think it's 1924, Congress has to take away uh, veterans' responsibility and put it more with a newly created Veterans Bureau because it's just too big a job that the public health service has ever had to do. But by that point, we're a couple years past, appropriations have been given, the public health service is not going to just immediately go away like that. Um, the public health service, though, in the 1920s is not going to be uh, sort of used in the same capacity that maybe it had wanted to be after 1918 and 1919. 
Uh, you get some directors in the public health service that are much more conservative, much more free market in their approach, and much more uh, probably wary of this socialistic sort of communistic model coming out of Russia about what not to do. And so they're fearful of maybe imposing that. And you've actually got some public health service directors that actually lobby to reduce their own appropriations throughout the 1920s. Uh, they actually managed to get the Shepherd Towner Act, which was maternal and child welfare. Uh, they get that slashed in 1929 because they're afraid this is putting, pushing us in realms that we don't need to go ideologically speaking. So uh, that, though, the, it gets overturned within the next couple of years with some other public health acts. There's a whole lot of political aspects going on here. There's a whole lot of things going on. Uh, some public health people are saying, you know, this affects people's lives, so I don't care about the ideology. People need this. And really, the public reaction was such that they wanted somebody like that helping them. They wanted these groups that could come in and sort of give them immediate help. Uh, in many of the areas in the country in 1918, 1919, public health is in its infancy. If it's there, it's weak, uh, probably outside of the major cities. It's almost non-existent. You go in the American South, uh, it is. there's a reason why the Rockefeller Foundation is down there and why they're working, because no one else is doing that job. You see, though, as you rightly point out, that the Rockefeller Foundation in the 1920s kind of changes their tactics. And I think it's because you do see more of an emphasis on sort of the governmental public infrastructure of public health along the way. And, and because the Rockefeller Foundation laid the foundation to work with the public health service throughout things like, I think it's trachoma, uh, maybe pellagra and things like that, things that they were working with and ex accepting uh, Rockefeller grants to do along the way. But then the Rockefeller group sort of sees that maybe there's uh, you know, a greater need outside the United States in the 1920s. Uh, they're more likely in the 1920s to look outward as businesses are and things like that. Uh, and so I, I'm not entirely well versed on the Rockefeller aspect of things in the 1920s. Uh, but you do see almost a recognition among the Rockefeller people that we're not perhaps as needed as we once were. They're still going to be there. They're still going to be there, in a, but in a more limited capacity along the way. Um, I, I don't remember other parts of the question that I didn't fully answer there. I, I Forgive me. I but somebody slipped through. Oh, sorry, I, I think it was this was great, uh, great start of, of, of the conversation, and I want to open up the floor to other questions. If uh, any of our participants has any question, please feel free to use the exactly the, <laughs> the hand button. And I see Professor Manela has a question. Hi, yes, thank you. I hope you can see me. I haven't used um, Microsoft Teams before. Um, thank you for an excellent paper. I, I, have a, I have a question that I guess takes us more than unsurprisingly to the present day. Um, thinking about these, these institutional changes, institutional evolution that, you're, that you uh, trace there in the paper with regard to the um, uh, flu pandemic, um, it, it, it strikes me if I if I think about the last 20 years, it strikes me as difficult to comprehend how after an event like 9-11, where we had several thousand Americans killed, there was a radical institutional overhaul in the US federal government, you know, the construction of the uh, Department of uh, Homeland Security, et, et, et cetera. Um, on the theory that the federal government uh, failed to uh, prevent 9-11 uh, because um, of some inst deep institutional dysfunction. Now we've had uh, the, the pandemic for already a year and a half, and it's killed, what, 200 times more Americans than 9-11, uh, um, not to mention what it's done in the rest of the world. And yet there doesn't seem to be anywhere like that push uh, for an institutional overhaul, we still have, we seem to still have the same institutions, both the federal and state levels. Uh, they clearly failed, yet, yet nobody's saying, oh, well, we have to completely change the Department of, 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 of um, Health and Human Services. We have to completely reconfigure the CDC. We have to, why is that? Uh, that's a great uh, question. And, and you reminded me, by the way, that I uh, 
Sorry, okay. sorry. Would you mind taking like a couple of questions and then going over them oh. so that sure. we can give everybody the <laughs> Thank you. So I have next in line uh, Nancy. Hi, Jonathan. Thank you so much. This is really interesting for me because it really pushes me to rethink some things I think have been assumed by many of us about what happened in the aftermath and the role of the federal government. So this is really exciting. My question, I guess, has to do with what this looked like at the local level. In other words, you suggest that um, that at the local level, it's quickly evident that the flu pandemic is beyond the control of local authorities. And yet, of course, we know local authorities are acting all the way through. How how are you finding or what helps you see sort of a shift for the public from do they see that there's a local failure and then a, a federal intervention that is successful or what are, what are you seeing on the ground that helps you um, uh, make this conclusion, which I think is, again, really important. And a second follow up, is there an important element here? One of the things you just said really resonated for me. Is there an important distinction between what's happening locally in major cities like Seattle and Philadelphia and St. Louis that we all talk about so much and these smaller rural communities? Are those two really different stories in terms of their relationship with the, with the local versus federal? And again, thank you. Just interesting, interesting work. Go on, Jonathan. Thank you. Oh, OK. Uh, I, I think, uh, Arez, uh, that was, uh, you reminded me that I didn't answer part of Simon's question, too, about the modern day aspects of it. I apologize for that. Uh, you bring up this why, why no response in the same way. Uh, and I think that's a great question. And honestly, that question about why we don't think about disease more is what initially attracted me to want to study disease. I was one of those weird people that, but now I'm with other people of like mind. It's nice. Uh, but you, why, why this? Why don't we have this reaction? That's honestly why I, like, I got interested in the Spanish flu, just because I thought, why, why am I not seeing this? Uh, and I think that's a, it's a deep question. It goes to a, sort of a psychological nature of humans that we tend to look at things and try to study things that we can understand completely. As, as weird as it sounds, like wars. You know who starts a war. You know when it starts. You know when it stops. You know who's responsible, those type of things. Things that we sort of feel that we have less control over, like disease, at least earlier on in human history, uh, it was sort of like outside the uh, understanding of humans. They just kind of happen. You live with them. You move on. Uh, I think the 20th century has changed that with the bacteriological and the virology revolutions along the way. And I think we're still kind of grappling with this idea that diseases can be, and epidemics and even pandemics can be prevented in some ways. And I think you're seeing some of the debates over that now, like, well, is this... You know, natural? Is it concocted in a lab? All those types of questions. And should, and, but there is also, I think, too, in our modern day, a political element of a suspicion that the uh, federal government is not telling us the truth, which I don't think is something that's unique to this situation. I think it's been building uh, for decades in American history. Uh, but in most of the time, that suspicion is going to hold back a sort of widespread building. Um, when we got hit, by, you know, with terrorism in 9/11, there was a sense of okay, we can figure out what went wrong. We know who to blame for this, and we can, for lack of a better phrase, make them make them pay in, in some ways. Uh, it's hard to make a virus pay, uh, and because you can't necessarily put a face with that, you can't put sort of focus your anger on something that you can recognize. Uh, I think we react in a different way, but that that goes into a lot more of a psychological aspect of why we don't view the disease the same way as we do, say, terrorism or wars or things like that. Uh, and I, I probably don't have a much better answer than that in terms of why we don't see that response coming from it. Uh, but it's a great question. Uh, Simon, uh, I'll come back to you, uh, Nancy, in just a second. But Simon asked about sort of modern day COVID and those type of things. Uh, I, I I think uh, kind of going along with the previous answer, you don't see a, a, a respect for medically trained professionals in some ways that you had maybe after Spanish flu. Uh, there was a sense that, you know, people on all levels in public health, they had an education, they knew what they were doing. Maybe that's a progressive era way of thinking, like we got to trust the experts. Now there's this deeply ingrained suspicion in American thinking, which in some ways has always been there about Americans. We're always suspicious of something, but now it's focused very much on the government and focused on these people who are telling us how to behave. And sort of the immediate reaction of a lot of people is, where do you get off telling me how I should be thinking or what I should be doing or what I should be taking in terms of prevention and things like that? And so uh, I think the climate has changed in terms of uh, 
and plus, I think in the last 100 years, we sort of think we're past disease in some ways. I think we sort of think, well, diseases are bad, but they're kind of off in the distance, and therefore vaccines don't do anything anymore. And so those great things that we read about in the past, that's not my world. And those things can't touch me anymore. And what's really been fascinating to me is we haven't had the reverse of that this time around. I thought perhaps with a huge pandemic, people would say, I need to protect myself in ways that my parents, my grandparents' generations had talked about. But you don't see that. And I, I think that story is something we're going to have to study over the next couple of years is why we haven't had that same reaction. Because I think it's, there's, there's much more to it than probably just a hesitation in terms of medicine and things like that. Um, all right, uh, Nancy, back to you in terms of local level. Uh, I, I, in, in part of the thing that you get to see is a, the amount of records. And what I've seen is that in the local level, a lot of the records are surrounding major cities like Boston and New York and places like that. Uh, but you do recognize uh, that when you read through those uh, those accounts, they they're just almost lost. Like they just they don't know what to do. Uh, their own people are getting sick. And so they're worrying about what to do because they have no real answers whatsoever. Nothing seems to work. It seems to be spreading no matter what steps they take. And when the public health service comes in, you see this immediate almost like burden lifted, lifted off their chests. Uh, in fact, uh, there's a whole sort of legal aspect of this, which I kind of touched on in the paper, that in order to practice medicine inside of a state, you have to be licensed by that state. And so public health officials coming in, they lack in many ways those state licenses. And by actually taking uh, on those state personnel and making them public health people, then those state people can actually license other people to work in the state in order to make it all legal because the federal government just does not have the ability to come in and treat people directly. On the state level, oftentimes there was um, local directives about you had to have doctors that had registered with the local office for the county office or had to be working for the county health department to be able to uh, operate in those areas and so there are not just state laws but they're actually like county laws too they're doing the same thing and counties behave in many ways that the states do they kind of just throw up in the gate and uh, there is this really interesting thing where public health officials um, they're public health they're funded by the federal government they become state officials and they take on a, a local county level too uh, title. Their, their titles would have been huge just so that they can sort of operate in those areas without having anybody be able to stop them legally by doing so. But you, I haven't seen any accounts of local governments saying, you know, we're, we're not going to allow you to do that here. We don't trust you. Even in the very rural areas, in, the, in fact, in the very rural areas are the ones that are the most open. And maybe that's the Rockefeller Foundation background. Maybe that's just the fact that there are so many endemic diseases uh, they are just eagerly clamoring, clamoring for anything. And when the federal government comes in and offering to help, it's an eager embrace of that. Uh, on the ground, on the local levels, you have, in some cases, uh, I was reading about one, I think it's out in Mississippi, where you have a county health director who, by a twist of fate, becomes the state health director, but then becomes like the regional director of the public health service, all within a matter of weeks. And so he just goes around and he is the most heavy handed of all these officials. He cancels county fairs. He cancels church. He cancels everything. I mean, he you almost see a sense of somebody who has sudden power. But the really interesting thing is no one challenges him. You look in the newspapers, you look in other things. No one says anything about it because I think there is this almost panic and desire for someone to make it all right, that they're willing to just go ahead and accept anything. And I haven't seen any backlash whatsoever. Um, in the cities, you don't see it much, uh, but certainly on the local levels, I've never seen anything of any real import saying, this is wrong, let's refuse this. It's almost like if someone's refusing you charity, I mean, so I wanna give you charity, it's tough to say, no, I don't want that anymore, uh, especially when you got sick and dying and stuff like that, so. Uh, there's a lot that goes into it, but I think it possibly it goes into just the, the realities of what life was like for many people. When you've got someone offering something, you just end up latching onto it. Well, thank you, Jonathan. Thanks a lot. I mean, this is really fascinating. Uh, I had uh, a question from Naomi for a while, and then she lowered her hand. So I just wanted to ask her if she still wants to... No, that that's okay. I can see we're running a little late, and just to say wh what a what a great conversation this was. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Naomi. Well, may maybe I have a, a very 
quick question that goes back to uh, one of the points that Simon was raising, and it was about the, the trust and credibility, because uh, it's really something I like in, in both your paper and your presentation, uh, the, the ways in which trust and credibility actually foster it uh, uh, the, and uh, allowed also for, for the federal government to, to increase its role and its participation in, in the planning of, of a public health eff effort uh, uh, throughout the country. But I was wondering, what are the roots of, of this uh, trust and credibility, and more uh, specifically, uh, whether these roots are uh, uh, traceable in the war, in the war efforts, that uh, was already giving, you know, uh, the government that sort of role and was, uh, you know, the war efforts uh, also meant, you know, the, the creation of the very first federal effort in terms of propaganda. So mm -hmm. the, 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 the government was having already a very important public prominence in this regard. And I was wondering if this was in a way, in any way connected with, with the increase also of, of, of in the, in the field of public uh, else. And I have another question from, from Gaetano, if you don't mind, I, I will immediately give him. Hello, do we have time? Can I, can I? Yes, we still have like a couple of minutes. So. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jonathan, for the great paper and, and conversation. I have a quick question that goes back to something that you mentioned in your first reply, when you said that at some point there were uh, public health officials that were concerned about the possibility or the risk of adopting practices or models that they somehow disliked or feared. Uh, you made the assumption of the of socialist Russia. And so I was wondering what kind of circulation of ideas and expertise there was at the time, and if there was any, any specific models that, that those uh, US officials were, were looking at, it was some sort of an inspiration in terms also of what kind of institutions and an organization that, that uh, needed to be built and, and organized uh, for the, uh, in order to cope with the pandemic at the time, a kind of you know, international cooperation, if, if we can call it such, uh, there was at the time. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, as far as sort of the sphere of maybe uh, Bolshevizing public health and things like that, uh, there isn't a, I don't know how to say this gently, um, there isn't a firm understanding of how you could Bolshevize public health, uh, but there was this fear that if somehow the public, the federal government took over, it was going to happen. And so it became, much like it does during the Cold War, almost like this uh, word that you could say in order to uh, you know, paint your opponents as being the enemy of anything American. And uh, what, what is interesting is that there are some public health officials who are worried about other groups or perhaps uh, this happening who end up undermining their own, or their own causes along the way. Uh, because there is such a, there's an amazing difference of where the uh, public health service directors come from. Uh, many of them come from the South and they've got sort of very different ideas about what public health should be vis-a-vis uh, -vis those that have sort of trained in northern cities where you have more of an established infrastructure for those type of things. Uh, it gets to a point uh, where uh, they have, there's two guys in the 1920s that just flat out dislike each other, and they just, uh, one keeps reassigning someone to all these outposts so they get them to shut up, and uh, eventually uh, he just kind of goes away, but the other guy eventually uh, passes away and the other guy kind of succeeds him. Uh, but there is this sense that they were Bolshevizing, they were hitting that all their opponents uh, that had said, you know, maybe the federal government should take more of a role in things. Uh, but uh, you were talking, uh, uh, Dario, about uh, the infrastructure, uh, I believe. Was, was that your question? Remind me just for a second. Was that? Okay. Um, the infrastructure that existed because of war, I would say that some of that cooperation and credibility had established in the late 19th century where you start to have some working together. It's very limited. But... You have that growing in some ways uh, during the 20th century, but the war actually disrupts a lot of the uh, of the trust between the sides because many of the state and even the public health service doctors volunteer for army work because it's more prestigious. And so they're left with this dearth of people that actually like can run things. And that's why there's so few people to tackle things like influenza. But uh, what happens then is that you have very little working relationship in many states between the states and the federal government. It's there, it can operate, maybe with publications, educational campaigns, those type of things, but it's not around very much. But at the Spanish influenza, because they're forced to work together, and indeed they become part of one organization, at least temporarily, people are mixing in ways that they never had before, uh, on, the, on the local, on the state, and on the federal level. And that establishes just sort of a working relationship, almost like people in the military. You put together a bunch of different people, you end up working together, you end up knowing each other, and you trust them in some ways. So much so that afterwards, there almost is a sense of let's keep this going. 
uh, that we, this is what we can do when we're sort of break down these barriers between us. Now, not everybody agrees with that, but there is enough of this level force, force pushing upward that will bring some changes later on down the road. Um, thank you, Jonathan. This is really fascinating. It reminds me of a lot of things, you know, that go also diachronically with, with the Cold War, the creation of the national security state. So th there is much to be uh, talked about. But thank you. Thanks a lot. This has been enlightening. Now, uh, we move to the second panel of, of this afternoon session, uh, which is uh, a panel that will see the participation of Bob Reynard and Erez Manela. And I wanted to ask uh, Bob if you have a PowerPoint to share, if you need any help or if you don't need Well, I, I, I definitely need help, but uh, <laughs> that's, in, that's in other issues. I think I've already had enough technical problems this morning. I'm not going to push the envelope with a PowerPoint presentation. Oh. So. Um, no PowerPoint presentation, just uh, just my ugly mug and a few words. <laughs> okay, okay, don't worry, don't worry. I mean, but if there's anything I can do to to help you with any technological issue, just let me know. You can even send me an email. It's it's fine. Uh, let me just briefly introduce uh, both of you. Uh, now, uh, uh, Bob. Bob's presentation is titled American Liberalism and Smallpox Eradication in Western Central Africa, Pursuing Humanitarian and Foreign Policy Objectives. Uh, Bob teaches environmental history, public history, history of the American West, and history of public health at Boys State University. In uh, 2015, Bob has also published a book on America's efforts to eradicate small, smallpox, which is, I guess, uh, uh, where is uh, basing also is his uh, speech uh, today. And uh, the commentator for uh, Bob's uh, paper and for uh, this panel is going to be uh, Professor Erez Manela, who is Professor of History at Harvard University, where he teaches the history of the United States in the world and modern international history. Well, Professor Manela is, of course, one of the leading scholars in the field of 20th century international history, and his seminal publications include works on Wilsonianism, on global development, and on global uh, crisis. So without further ado, uh, I will give first Bob the floor and then Professor Manela for his comments. Thank you. Thank you, Dario. Thanks for serving as chair for this. Thanks to everybody for tuning and zooming in. Please let me know if you can't hear me. Um, and I uh, thanks also to Giles for put, uh, convening this fascinating and important conference and for inviting me to participate in it. Um, and I, I really want to thank Arez for serving as commentator on my paper, um, not just because it's a great honor to have him do that, but also because it's the latest in the many ways that he has generously supported this project uh, over the years. Many years ago, I think it was 10 years ago, uh, Erez took a phone call from me and gave me some sage advice, and he's continued to do that over the years, patiently watching me blunder my way through this topic. So I'm grateful and immensely pleased to have the opportunity to hear from him today about this topic in which we both share an interest. Um, some brief apologies. My paper and presentation is a condensed version of elements of my book on smallpox eradication, which was published six years ago now. I have since then moved on to a very different research agenda. Um, and so my engagement with this material is not as fresh or perhaps as sharp as I'd like it to be, but still I'm grateful for the opportunity to revisit this topic and an argument that I developed as a graduate student. And I think you'll undoubtedly notice still bears the marks of that traumatic period in a scholar's life. So um, where my story on smallpox eradication begins uh, for the purposes of this paper and really in the book is in 1965. And of course, the history of smallpox goes back much further than that, tens of thousands of years for the disease, which killed somewhere in the neighborhood of 300 million people in the 20th century alone. Um, the history goes back hundreds of years to the, uh, to the first vaccine, the very first vaccine for any disease in 1796. And then the history of eradication um, goes back at least until the uh, beginning of the post-World War II period when the first proposals to eradicate smallpox came up in the World Health Assembly. But in 1965, a few very important things happened um, at the World Health Assembly, which would be the uh, agency or rather the institution that would guide the organization, the World Health Organization and its global efforts to eradicate smallpox. In 1965, the World Health Assembly passed a resolution which reasserted the organization's commitment to global smallpox eradication. What's important about that is that the resolution was sponsored by the United States which up till that point had not expressed much interest in smallpox eradication. 
But in um, not only did the U.S. support that resolution or put that resolution forward, but also in November, the United States announced its own bilateral program in 19 countries in West and Central Africa, which would be called the Smallpox Eradication and Measles Control Program, which was coordinated by the CDC, then the Communicable Disease Center, and sponsored by USAID, the State Department's Economic Development and Assistance Office. Now, this represented a significant shift in the American position on smallpox eradication, which heretofore had been one of sort of general, but uh, kind of abstract support and certainly without significant investment in American dollars up until then. So the question driving this paper is really, why did that happen? Why did that shift happen? Now, others have provided very compelling answers to this question of how and why the US got involved in smallpox eradication. People that were involved in the program like DA Henderson, who was the head of the WHO's efforts and before that, put together the CDC's program, um, uh, talks about it being basically a matter of good timing and smart efforts on the part of the CDC, that there was an opportunity for the CDC to get involved at that particular moment, and they got a green light, much to Henderson's surprise, as, as he recalls. Um, another really important argument among scholars is that the effort of people like Henderson at the CDC hit the Johnson administration at a moment when that administration wanted to show good international will, or pardon me, international goodwill, make a public effort or demonstration of international cooperation and exercise its internationalist approach. And Arez has made this argument most effectively and persuasively. And then finally, and I think this is maybe where some of the most interesting scholarship is coming from right now on smallpox eradication, is that the nations and individuals in the developing, or as it was called then, third world, were pushing for and shaped for and shaped this program. And Sanjoy Patachara has long led an effective charge um, for this interpretation. My contribution, such as it is to these persuasive and important arguments, is that the American commitment to smallpox eradication represented a step towards a global great society. It was a liberal effort to engage with the decolonizing Cold War world by manipulating the non-human world, including diseases. And I wanna sort of draw your attention to three components of that. When I say engaging with the decolonizing Cold War world, I mean that in two ways. First of all, by helping them, a genuine belief and an effort to improve health. Humanitarianism is a real thing, but also uh, as an effort to achieve foreign policy objectives, namely by keeping those decolonizing regimes in the American camp, or at least on some sort of neutral ground during the Cold War. Um, but I think most importantly for me as an environmental historian, um, which is my training and my passion, um, this bit about the non-human natural world, that the idea would be that these humanitarian and foreign policy objectives would be achieved by ma manipulating and then perhaps even mastering the non-human natural world. And there were other ways that the Johnson administration sought to do this, river development on the Mekong Delta, international exchange of nuclear energy technology, dissemination of fertilizers and other tools of the Green Revolution, even a worldwide weather control system that Johnson got really excited about. Now, none of those were as successful as smallpox eradication. Within three years, the program in West and Central Africa had basically achieved eradication there. And by 1977, the global program, which was inspired, I think, by the West and Central Africa program, isolated the last naturally occurring case of smallpox and in 1980, the World Health Assembly declared victory over smallpox. So smallpox then I argue was the perfect target for the global great society, a limited and contained, yes, but also dramatic and important in its humanitarian and foreign policy objectives. So how do I try to explain and prove this analysis or this interpretation? Well, first in the paper and in my book, I, I explore individuals and what they had to say and how they supported smallpox eradication. And, I look at individuals and in agencies that supported the program like DA Henderson at the CDC or uh, Dr. Philip Lee, who served at both USAID and then also at the Department of Health, Education and Welfare, who enthusiastically and effectively pushed for smallpox eradication and other health programs that would really demonstrate not only the US commitment to international health programs, but also the US ability through liberal bureaucracy and organization and tools to be able to master these problems. And then I also look up at Lyndon Johnson himself, himself, who, although I think it's clear he was not as directly engaged with this as Dr. Lee or uh, Henderson, I also think he clearly voiced his approval for the program um, and created situations where people like Lee and Henderson felt encouraged to propose ambitious health programs. 
I also look at US agencies and how they approach smallpox eradication. I think in the State Department and USAID, um, you see in, for example, their uh, efforts to, uh, in their support for the program as it was put forward to the president, um, USAID noted, quote, the exceptional response from governments throughout Africa, end quote, to the CDC's efforts. So seeing in this an ability to exercise some influence and soft power, perhaps. Um, and then I think uh, I, I also try to explore how the CDC, not only was a matter of good timing, as Henderson would argue, um, but also they proposed a bilateral program that was both ambitious and dramatic, the eradication of the disease, but also pretty limited um, with a budget of uh, $36 million for five years, and it came in under budget and, and uh, faster than expected. Um, I also look at the program itself and how it evolved. Um, so this might be helpful to think about what it wasn't. Um, the, the program in West and Central Africa, and in fact, the US getting involved with smallpox eradication at the beginning, was not the US committing whole hog to global smallpox eradication. This was a bilateral program and the US would hold the purse strings and the levers of control. Only after that success would the US get into the global program and still tentatively and with limits. And the program in West and Central Africa was also, as I noted before, about smallpox eradication and measles control, recognizing the difficulty, perhaps even the impossibility of eliminating the much trickier and virulent measles virus. And ultimately, and maybe we'll have some time to talk about this, it's hard to see any clear foreign policy gains from this program for the United States. But what was it though? It was the first and to date only deliberate eradication and elimination of a human disease. And that is a remarkable accomplishment. And I can share an interesting story with one of my graduate advisors later on where she course corrected me on something with this. Um, but I think that needs to be understood and applauded. And uh, from that announcement in 1965, it took just over 10 years to eliminate a disease that had plagued humanity for millennia. So where does that leave us? It leaves us with the legacy of the program and its limits, what was actually accomplished, but also a recognition of the massive victory for humanity as participants in the program recognized. So uh, I think I'm right maybe at my 10 minutes, um, maybe even came under a little bit if I got lucky. So I'll then look forward to hearing from all of you. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks a lot, Bob. Thank you. And you've been perfectly on time. Uh, so now I'd like to give the floor to Erez Manela. Uh, thank you, Dario, for the kind introduction, and, and thank you, Giles, for uh, inviting me to, to this, and thank you, Bob, for so generously exaggerating my influence on your project. Um, it's, a, it's a fascinating paper. I have a, a series of uh, comments, um, perhaps a question or two, and you can do with those uh, what you will. Um, first, the, the idea of the Global Great Society, uh, uh, it, it reminded me, among other things, of a manuscript that I, I recently read of a forthcoming book, I think it's due out next uh, month, uh, by Mark Lawrence at the University of Texas, called The End of Ambition. The End of Ambition. And it, it, it basically tracks uh, US uh, foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis the third world uh, in the 1960s, so from Kennedy to Nixon, and makes the argument that uh, the Kennedy era saw a, a kind of peak of US ambition mm -hmm. for the sort of developmentalist projects that um, smallpox uh, represents, and that that declined quickly throughout the, the Johnson administration and essentially largely disappeared by the Nixon administration. Um, and I think that the, the, the kind of trajectory that uh, Lawrence maps out in that, um, uh, book actually fits very well, Bob, with uh, what you're describing. You know, um, Lyndon Johnson, you start out with Lyndon Johnson as vice president. That's under the Kennedy administration. That's the early 60s where he's all excited about doing things for the third world. And then, of course, by the mid-1960s, he's president. Uh, he's got a lot of other things to worry about. Vietnam is not going very well. Uh, third world post-colonial countries and governments are criticizing the United States more and more in international reforms, including in the WHO. Um, be, uh, or, or the World Health Assembly actually because of uh, Vietnam. Um, and he, he, his enthusiasm to some extent at least curdles um, over, this, uh, over this period of uh, time. So in some sense, maybe we can think about uh, uh, his, his agreement to smallpox eradication as a kind of remnant uh, 
uh, of um, uh, the enthusiasm of, or the ambition, as Lawrence calls it, of the um, of the early nineteen mm sixties. -hmm. Um, and I think in the paper you explained nicely about why that actually managed to squeeze through because it was cheap and it was um, uh, and it was finite and and it seemed to and it seemed to promise uh, a lot for relatively relatively little. Um, I. That actually, though, kind of brings me to uh, to a point which I've I've been thinking about quite some quite some time about uh, about this issue of uh, smallpox eradication as a as a foreign policy problem. By the way, incidentally, in this entire uh, end of ambition manuscript that covers the 1960s, uh, as you might not be surprised to learn, Bob, uh, Mark Lawrence does not mention smallpox even once, um, which. Which is, of course, all of us who work in this field of global health uh, through the lens of foreign policy are are endlessly frustrated by by this kind of parallel universes um, where there's foreign policy that exists in one universe and and uh, in global health that exists in another, and never the twain shall meet. I once long ago published an article called "The Pox on Your Narrative," which tries to call out um, uh, the diplomatic history people on that. With I, I'm afraid very limited success. Um, but in any case, what I wanted to focus on uh, with the remainder uh, of of my uh, of my time is um, is, is this this notion of of the, the way, at least for me, that thinking about global health, particularly about specifically here about smallpox eradication, um, cues us into the fact that it's perhaps useful to think of U.S. foreign policy not as a single foreign policy, hmm. but as several different foreign policies that work in. Parallel. Sometimes they intersect. Sometimes they actually um, clash. And let me just give two examples uh, uh, on that. First, um, the the actual decision to pass the budget um, for the smallpox eradication program. This came a year after uh, the formal declaration that you mentioned, Bob. This is 1966 World Health Assembly. Um, you know, the previous year the United States had gotten on board, and so uh, the uh, Director of the uh, WHO was tasked with pr presenting an actual plan to carry this through, and because, as as you know, Bob uh, Kandau, Mark Lina Kandau, who was then the director, uh, was skeptical about the whole thing. He he did this typical bureaucratic maneuver, which is when you get asked to do something you don't want to do, you make a budget ask that you think will will get uh, denied, and then you can say, well, you didn't give me the budget, so I can't do this. So he asked for an additional $2.4 million in 1966, which doesn't sound like a lot by our terms, but in the context of the time and of the WHO budget, it was quite a bit, I think it was like a, a, an addition of like 30% of the w, total WHO budget at the time. And he thought this was going to be declined. And, and what's interesting here is that even though the Johnson administration was technically on board with smallpox, global smallpox eradication, they actually didn't want to vote for this budget addition because they didn't want to pay this much money. Uh, they didn't think that Congress would go for this um, and, and that there would be domestic um, politics to pay here. And so the United States actually ends up voting against this. Uh, along with some of the other major funders like France, uh, the WHO, uh, but it actually gets the, the required two thirds um, majority in the WHA because post-colonial nations by, by that time had proliferated and vote for it. And the interesting part of it is that the representatives of post-colonial nations at the WHA in Geneva in 1966 were encouraged to do this behind the scenes by American members of the American delegation um, <laughs> public health people who actually wanted to get this done. And so the United States on the one hand officially is opposing this, but unofficially behind the scenes is a different foreign policy. Uh, let's call it the foreign policy of the CDC. You know, there's a foreign policy of Washington, there's a foreign policy of the State Department, the foreign policy of the CDC are actually, actually at, at loggerheads um, in, this, in this. So there is one formal po foreign policy, but there are actually at least two policies. Uh, going on and that's how this actually passes this budget actually passes 1966. let me just give one other example and this is directly to your uh, uh, your story there the west africa program the west africa program in, in my view can can be seen as a kind of intersection of three separate american foreign policies one is the foreign policy of the nih the mm -hmm. nih wanted along with Merck, who was man who just manufactured the measles vaccine, they wanted to test the measles vaccine on, on a large scale. They couldn't really do this in the United States, both because measles wasn't as, um, well, because all sorts of reasons which you can imagine. So Af West Africa was an easy place and, and measles was a major, major problem in West Africa. 
Um, and so, as, as you mentioned, the uh, leaders there, many of the many post-colonial leaders are, wanted the measles vaccine to come. Uh, so the NIH wanted to test the measles vaccine. UHAID uh, UHA wanted to um, uh, get uh, win hearts and minds in, in, in newly independent countries in West Africa. But if you'll recall, uh, Bob, they initially only wanted to do this in Francophone countries, only in Francophone countries. Um, and the reason was that they were really annoyed by France at the time. Remember, this is de Gaulle, uh, the second de, mm -hmm. uh, uh, de Gaulle administration. He's just pulled out of NATO. He's gone to, to Moscow. He's making noises about how he's going to be neutral. Uh, that was incredibly annoying uh, to the State Department. They, and, and one of the ways they wanted to, to, to punish France was by undermining their influence in, in Francophone West Africa, among other things, by, by doing this measles campaign. Um, and from Merck's perspective, from the NIH perspective, doing this in just Francophone countries is fine, you know, because that, that, that'll, that'll, you know, they don't expect to eradicate measles, but, but they want to test out their vaccine. Uh, but then the, the foreign policy of the CDC, that's the third element. So we have NIH, USAID, the CDC, they actually want to eradicate something and they know they can't eradicate measles. So, so they, Henderson asks them to add smallpox into the mix of vaccine that they deliver. But he also says, well, we have to do this in the Anglophone countries too, because uh, otherwise we can't, it's not going to work. The borders are too porous. And, and because it's so cheap, he, he gets them to agree to do this. Um, and they do a measles slash, as you know, this wasn't just smallpox. It was actually smallpox slash measles. Um, and they, they managed to do this. They managed to significantly reduce measles and to eradicate smallpox in West Africa uh, through this project. But but this 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 comes out of a of a kind of uh, happy intersection of three different American foreign policies, three different sets of interests, and and to me this it's it's absolutely fascinating to see it in that in that lens. And I wonder um, the last thing uh, I wonder what you think about about this. The last thing I, I'll say uh, just goes to the very the way you end the paper, which is uh, citing one of the participants. I think it was Newberry who says, "Well, we didn't leave anything behind." Um, if you ask, in my experience, if you ask some of the others, I mean, Henderson, unfortunately, has passed away, but if you asked him, he would have said, I think, that the imp most important legacy of smallpox eradication is the um, extended program, expanded program on immunization mm -hmm. um, that the WHO continued running afterwards, which actually, uh, for a while there, directed by Rafe Henderson, who, who uh, got cut his teeth in, in West Africa. Um, and, and so, I guess there's that perspective as well that the that the EPI um, emerged out of smallpox eradication, and, and if that's the case, then it's a very significant uh, legacy right there. I'll end. I'll. I'll, I'll I, I could say a lot more, but I'll just end it here and come go back to you. Dario, is it all right? What would you prefer that I can I respond now, and then I'll look forward to other questions. So um, thanks, Arez. This is great. I. Um, you know, I, I owe you so many beers. I cannot even begin to think of all of the meals that I owe you for, not just today, but um, again, all the ways that you've helped out and all of the ways that you've made this better and all the ways that it's not good, those are on me. <laughs> um, I look forward to this book from Mark Lawrence. I just uh, did a presentation to the LBG library, LBJ library a couple weeks ago. And um, uh, so I look forward to what Mark has to say about that. Um, I think what you've you've said about these multiple foreign policies is so helpful for me, for me, especially as an environmental historian. I think one of the obvious failings of our or challenges, let me put it that way, of my approach as an environmental historian is that I end up looking at human, non-human, natural world relations, and those become sort of categories where I don't really dig enough inside of the human category. In this case, one of those areas that I don't dig into, I haven't really thought about enough, are the different kinds of foreign policy, as you've pointed out, that are sometimes um, uh, you know, dovetailing quite nicely, other times uh, colliding, um, uh, conflicting with each other. Um, I think that's, um, that's something that I would like to spend a lot more time thinking about and diving into. I'm thinking about what the West and Central Africa program and these three foreign policies from the NIH, USAID, and the CDC. I think that's absolutely helpful in understanding how the program got started how it developed, but then I, I would also think about um, what version of that program succeeded in the end. Um, that is to say, what did it end up looking like? And it started off as, you know, we're gonna put two jet injectors on every kid's arm, one with smallpox vaccine, the other with measles vaccine, more, that's oversimplifying it. 
But as the so for a mass vaccination campaign, the idea being we'll be able to eradicate smallpox and we'll do lots of great work against measles while we're at it. But as the program evolved, it became clear that that was not going to work. Mass vaccination was not going to work. They changed strategies to this older strategy that had been on for a long time, surveillance and containment, which is basically just about focusing on where's the outbreak, let's contain the outbreak in those places. Um, which is to say, and, and, and that ends up really taking measles control and pushing it even further to the margins. So, you know, the NIH's foreign policy becomes sort of totally unimportant in all of this. Um, as for USAID's hopes to engage only with francophone uh, countries, that's actually fallen to the wayside as well. And so the one that comes to the fore is this focus on smallpox eradication, smallpox eradication only during the program, really. Um, and that comes about because of the conditions in West and Central Africa, how it was going to be impossible to do mass vaccination for nomadic groups, for instance. So you can, the way that I kind of look at that is as a, a response of the eradication program to the human, non-human, natural world interactions. Um, and then what you've proposed uh, really thoughtfully about this foreign policies um, helps me think a little bit more about that. So those are some tentative answers to what are always really great thoughts. Oh, and the EIP. Such a good example of, a, of another legacy. Um, and it is interesting to see, I think sometimes the difference between um, people like Henderson or others who were at the top of the level and are, were, were sort of at the top of the program and sometimes people that were there on the ground and how they saw significant differences in, in terms of smallpox, but didn't see significant differences sometimes beyond that, I suppose. But um, Thanks, Therese, you've given me, as always, lots to think about. I really appreciate it. And yeah, both of you actually gave us a lot to <laughs> think about, so th th thank you. Uh, I would like to open the floor to, to questions, if there's uh, any coming. Well, while we wait, I I have one question for, for, for you, Bob, because, of course, I wasn't aware of, of uh, Lauren's book, uh, which I really look forward to, to reading. But when you were talking, especially, you know, about the, the overlaps and the relationship between foreign policy making and uh, human, non-human non uh, elements and no, human, non-human relations, I was thinking of Jacob Darwin Hamlin's book, uh, Arming Mother Nature, and how this, you know, I, I'm kind of an environmental historian too, so I, I really imbued in that sort of, of studies in which, you know, nature is, uh, has been, uh, in which government have been bending nature, you know, to their own uh, foreign policy objectives. And I was thinking uh, a lot about this sort of liberal optimism that the, the smallpox uh, initiative kind of entails. And I was wondering if you think that this eventually changes or when do you think this this ends mm -hmm. this sort of, of, of liberal optimism because if it is true on the one end that we have different you know foreign policies interests, the different conflicting foreign, foreign policies interests, there's also a moment in which, you know, the ideology driving and motivating foreign policy uh, switches and turns mm -hmm. from, from liberalism to more neoliberal approaches where the, the private interests start being a main vector, you know, a main, money, a main push for, for, for uh, uh, even, you know, affecting the uh, human, non-human relations you were talking about. I mean, I've seen the is, for instance, what concerns waste disposal, uh, and in which you know at certain point toward the end of the of, of the seventies, the national interest is sidelined in favor of, of private interests. And do you think this happens also in in in, in the world of, of viruses or in other non-human uh, worlds? Yeah. And Thanks, then I, I have one question from Sarah Snyder. Hi, um, thank you very much uh, for your book and your presentation today. Um, I apologize a bit to people who have only read the paper. Um, my question is drawn more from the full chapter. I was struck by um, how many of the, the sort of on the ground people um, that you talked about uh, had one of the sort of influences for them um, to get involved in this was about trying to avoid the draft in Vietnam. Um, and you talked, you have this line where you say, um, 
for these people, for Thompson, Roy, Masso, and others, smallpox eradication represented not only an escape from the Vietnam War, but also an opportunity to show that they could make a positive difference in the world. And I wonder how much you saw sort of at higher levels um, that people were thinking about smallpox eradication as a counterpoint to Vietnam um, and maybe thinking in particular about Arez's idea of these multiple foreign policies. Do you see at any point that people are saying this part of the government, the DOD, um, they're waging war, but what we're doing is engaging in this peaceful campaign, a peaceful spreading um, of American values. So I'd just be interested to hear how much you saw broader reflection on, on that juxtaposition of the war and smallpox eradication. Yeah. Well, um, thank you, Sarah. And um, thank you not only for the great question, but also for having read the book. You're the one, I'm kidding. Um, and uh, Dario, I, I think uh, I'll, I'll respond to Sarah's question first and then come back to you since it's so fresh on my mind. Um, it's a great question about where, how far up the chain does this argument that um, we've got problems, <laughs> the, the US government is doing some bad things over here, but we're doing some really great things here with smallpox eradication. How far up the chain does that go? Um, I don't recall seeing from, you know, uh, Don Millar, or who was, who was head of the program out of Atlanta and really led it after Henderson left for the WHO. I don't see Millar or Henderson making that kind of an explicit and probably what they would judge to be um, uh, maybe not a politically wise statement about the US is messing up over in Vietnam, but we're doing great work over here. Um, but I think what you do see are the two things paired together in a way that um, sort of sees, <laughs> understands the, the inherent good and obvious value of smallpox eradication. And even Johnson himself said this. Um, I was looking through some of my notes and in 1967, Johnson signed this, what he regarded as a really gutted foreign aid package. Um, and uh, he was quoted in the press as saying something like, if we can, confront the aggressions of communism in Southeast Asia, we can also vaccinate 100 people, 100 million people against smallpox as our aid program did last year. So putting those two things together as um, not admitting that we're having trouble in Vietnam, but certainly sort of saying, um, this is part of us doing good in the world. Um, but I, I I, I would want to go back through the materials and, and look more for this contrast that that uh, that you see and definitely does appear among the people that are on the ground, you know, and some of their complaints, you know, why can't we get the axles for our Ford trucks? Well, they're all getting shipped over to Southeast Asia. Um, so there is that contrast at those lower levels, but I think that people like Henderson, Millar, others were uh, maybe a little bit too politically savvy to go too far down that road. I hope that helps respond to that question, Sarah, which is a really thoughtful one. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay. And then Dario, this this great question about where does, where, what happens to the idealism um, in American liberalism? Well, I, I think there's one part of it is that it gets, it, is that it gets pushed down um, um, by people who don't approve of spending a lot of government dollars on on these kinds of efforts. And I think of the West and Central Africa program and how towards the end, as it was becoming clear that, yay, we're succeeding, look at all that we've managed to accomplish. Um, there were also proposals like, wow, what else can we do? What, el what other diseases can we go after? And not just, not just to try to control them, but maybe we can really sort of go down the path of eradication with some other diseases. So continued optimism and enthusiasm and idealism, but, the administration has changed by this time. And you've got Nixon's administration in. And uh, I think it's Don Millar from the CD, uh, from Atlanta in the CDC. There's this really interesting telegraph that he sends to everybody um, that's working on the program in Western Central Africa, which is basically um, stop the chatter about expanding our programs and spending more money. Um, we've got a very different congressional and administration situ administrative situation. And if we overstep our bounds, we're gonna get audited. And sure enough, they were audited. <laughs> 
Um, and uh, there were a number of critiques about how far they have gone, where the money has been spent, why isn't USAID painted across the you know, side of every vial of vaccine? Why aren't we getting more uh, good press out of this? So um, yeah, I think that you have external pressures pushing against, um, against this idealism, um, late 60s, you know, even, in, but certainly by the, by the 70s. And I guess I would, my, my thinking about the program and the way that it evolves over the 70s, um, at least from the American perspective, is sort of an astute, keep your head down and trumpet your successes, but don't talk about the money that you're spending. Um, and uh, as for when sort of how, how sort of a, rely, a reliance on, on, on the private sector gets built in, that's kind of baked into the program from the beginning in some ways, you know, where are the tools coming from? Where's the vaccine coming from? But um, uh, again, another really thoughtful question that I look forward to thinking more about. Thanks, Dario. Uh, thank you, Bob, really enlightening. And I have Giles. Uh, thanks, Bob. Yeah, firstly, a comment on this um, smallpox Vietnam uh, dichotomy. I find that really intriguing. It reminds me of, of um, from my particular research field, those who kind of contrast, if you look at the history of the CIA, how, how can the CIA be the same organization that is um, backing the Congress for Cultural Freedom and, and these kind of art exhibitions and uh, journals like Encounter, and at the same time overthrowing uh, governments in Guatemala and, and, and Iran? You know, how, how can we understand the CIA is an organization, and, and, and this seems to be an, an interesting comparison to that, because um, it looks like yin and yang, but at the end of the day, um, smallpox in Vietnam, they're both about aimed at eradicating, delegitimizing uh, the same evil, really. Uh, and, and if you think about how communism is, was regarded as a disease, in, certainly in the 50s, um, I think uh, the, the, you don't have to work too hard to, to kind of see a, a line there. And I think yeah, that's really what you're edging towards in your uh, your answer to that question. I find it, you know, what's behind, the, what links the two? I think there is definitely a link. But my question is about something else. And that's about the relationship between the United States and international organizations. Because you, you said very interestingly that the uh, West Africa, Central Africa campaign was a bilateral program. So they're running this outside of uh, World Health Assembly, WHO. And, and I find it really intriguing that, you know, one of the big themes for our conference is um, the, the role of the US in the world um, on the issue of public health and delivering uh, global public goods uh, on health for, for citizens around the world. And, and what's interesting is we're dealing with the United States, which is fundamental for establishing or leading to the establishment of the League of Nations fundamental to the establishment of the United Nations, both the League and the UN having sizable um, roles in the provision of, of global public health. And yet we see the United States, this, this founding power, uh, you know, obviously never joined the League. And then also with the UN, uh, its key success, smallpox eradication, is, is run uh, separately. And I, and I just wonder if you um, could uh, comment on on that. It strikes me as a, a, a very interesting kind of backdrop to a lot of what we're going to be talking about. Dario, is it all right if I if I jump in? Um, I saw Rez has, has his hand up, so I look forward to what what he has to say about this too. Um, but I, you know what you said, Giles, takes us back to what Rez reminded us of, which is the budget in 1966 and how the US is part of the so-called Geneva group tries to scuttle that budget. Um, um, because I think the, I think the, one of the reasons for that is that it, it would, it would take this program. Let me try that again. Um, I think the, one of the attractive things about the West and Central Africa program was that it could be claimed by the United States as both its own program and as a contribution to this international Effort, which is what you know in the in the Johnson press releases and you know in celebration of the 250 million vaccine vaccination and smallpox. This both of those things come up. Look at what we as Americans are doing to help the rest of the world by cooperating with them. 
Um, so I, I think that uh, you know when we're thinking about U.S. foreign policy um, and its efforts in global health in the 1960s, um, which is kind of where I'm dealing with with this topic, I think you see um, a reluctance to hand over the purse strings and the keys to an international organization, um, but an also a desire to be associated with those and use those as kind of proof, like look, look at what we are doing. Um, and uh, you can see also in internal conversations at, uh, at meetings at the WHA, for instance, I'm thinking again about, the, about 1966 and what Arez was saying, um, you know, the, the US getting hammered for its involvement in Vietnam um, by the Soviet delegates and Soviet representatives, but the US saying, but what about what we're doing or what we're going to do with smallpox eradication in West and Central Africa? You know, we, we, <laughs> We are doing that thing as well. Well, why aren't you, you know, why won't you throw your support behind the budget that Kandao is asking for? Well, you know, this, you know we can't go that far with it. So um, that's kind of a scattered response to what you're saying. But again, I, I would come back to the US wants to get credit for both the things, um, doing it on its own and helping out the and, and playing nice with the rest of the world. And that's. Uh... Oh, sorry. I, uh, okay, I think I think I, I got the controls now. Um, thanks. I, you know, Bob, your recent just uh, what you just mentioned about the uh, critiques of the of the United States and the World Health Assembly reminded me of this episode. I was you know, I was reading the minutes of the World Health Assembly conversations, and and the Albanian delegate goes on and on about U.S. Um, crimes in Vietnam, and the um, presiding officer says, "Well, this is the World Health Assembly." Um, we can only talk about health issues. So then the Albanian delegate says, okay, well, let, let us talk about the health impacts of the use of napalm and Agent Orange and so mm -hmm. forth on the on the Vietnamese population. So, so um, which, very, very, so, so yes, they were getting hammered on this, but I, I actually wanted to um, continue uh, to the, this point that Giles just raised about uh, about this, this, this seeming contradiction, but then the, the things fit. Um, that in some ways, you know, um, smallpox, supporting smallpox eradication was just another way to fight the Cold War, to fight communism. Uh, and and as, as, as Bob says, you, you, certainly, you, you definitely see that in the rhetoric, uh, in the domestic U.S. rhetoric, especially when they're going to Congress to ask for budgets. Um, they, they talk about how this is going to uh, make these people less poor and therefore less vulnerable to communism, etc. Um, but... I never, you know, Bob and I both, I think, spoke to quite a few people who did, uh, Bob probably uh, a lot more than I did, but I never got a sense that a single one of these people actually believed this. Um, they they used this rhetoric uh, when they needed to, they knew to use it um, in order to get budgets, but, um, you know, they, I'd be hard pressed to say that any of them, any of them believed it. And in fact, not simply ideologically, but practically, people like Henderson knew that they had to have the Soviet Union on board, not just in the in the big picture, the WHO, but also um, on board and uh, on the ground, because they the um, at the in the early stages of the program, most of the smallpox vaccine that the um, program was using was manufactured in the Soviet Union. Um, there was just not enough manufacturing going on in the West. Um, and they were collaborating with uh, epidemiologists from um, uh, from the Soviet Union, from and from the Eastern Bloc, from Czechoslovakia. And some of the some of the main figures in in this in this uh, story are from either so Soviet Union or the Eastern Bloc in terms of the staffing of the program. So so this so so they understood this as a, as a collaboration. Um, that they being Henderson and, and and those sorts of people, um, and. He Henderson himself wrote a piece, I, I think it was titled something like Smallpox Ration Cold War Victory around 1980, mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. he talks about this. And the Cold War victory he's talking about is not smallpox eradication defeating communism, it's smallpox eradication um, giving a platform for collaboration between uh, the Soviet Union and the United States. So transcending the Cold War rather than winning it. Mm -hmm. And my sense is that the actual people who were doing the eradication that is if you want to say that, that from the perspective of USAID, yes, this was about fighting the Cold War and about let's have USAID in every vial. From the perspective of the foreign policy of the CDC, as I like to call it, this was about transcending the Cold War uh, rather than fighting it. Yeah, and I think you, you make that argument so so well. 
Um, and you can, I mean, when the, when the Cold War gets involved in the conversations or the experiences of people that were on the ground doing that, it's a pain in their ass. <laughs> you know, this is, this is something that we, oh, man, how are we going to navigate around this? And how can, who do we identify as the person that will help us get around this political problem that is really just a real hassle for us? But our goal here is beyond that, as you so eloquently and precisely say, transcending the Cold War. We, th this is not, we're not here to fight the Cold War. We're here to fight smallpox. Um, and the Cold War is, is, is getting in our way. Yeah, Henderson liked to tell this story, which may or may not be apocryphal, but he liked to tell it and told it frequently, is, is that when he, when he was um, approached about what the United States was doing in Vietnam, for example, in India, when he met with Indian officials, he would pretend to be Canadian. Um, <laughs> Uh, and which he wasn't, but he had he had family background in, in Canada, so he could say, "Well, look, I you know I'm Canadian," and and that that uh, sometimes seemed to work. So actually, uh, Henderson was very intent that the United States not hog the credit, um, and, and this was very intentional on this part because he knew that this would turn off the Soviets, and he and he couldn't afford that, and. Even decades later, he was resented for this, at least by some of the people in the CDC. Mm -hmm. um, they, they still thought 30 years later that they didn't get enough credit and they blamed Henderson uh, for this. Uh, so this is so quite an interesting and complicated story. It is very, very interesting that even if they did not believe in the Cold War framework, they were still using it in Congress to get funds. So it's like affirming by Congress, you know, that the performative role of the Cold War, especially internally, if not uh, internationally. Giles, you, you had another question, comment? No. No, not at all. Just uh, thank you very much to all speakers and commentators for, for a wonderful uh, opening session, a lot of food for thought, and uh, I pass the word back to you, Darian. Yes, indeed. I mean, it's been uh, uh, very generative, so thanks a lot. Thank you, Bob. Uh, thanks, uh, Eretz. And also thanks, uh, Jonathan and Simon and all the participants. This has been great. I mean, we've been touch touching upon so many interesting themes, you know, the, the, the role in the expansion of the federal government, the, the, how public health, you know, interplays with the projection of U.S. power abroad, how uh, public health and the creation of a system of, of national or international uh, governance of public health uh, in the end, characterize you know the the, the rise of, of American ascendancy of of the, of the American hegemony. Uh, how this you know uh, how challenging was uh, to deal with and to govern public health in a progressively more interdependent world. I think these are all ideas and themes that we will have the opportunity to further discuss in the next uh, couple of days. So I really want to thank you all, and I. Uh, uh, invite you all uh, to join us again tomorrow, uh, tomorrow afternoon in the Netherlands. Uh, so tomorrow in the morning, uh, in the, at least in the eastern part of the United States. I also want to thank Giles for all his efforts in putting this together. I think this is already great. So um, it's, it's always a pleasure for me to, to work uh, with you, man. Um, and that's it. I mean, ideally, you know, in a in-person situation, we would have concluded all of these with a gigantic round of applause, which I'm going to do anyhow. And perhaps with, with, with beer, with, with drinks uh, or, 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 or lunch, usually in Middleburg, I'm the one who pushes for having at least one Italian dinner in this kind of, of settings. I hope we will be able to do this again uh, in presence soon. It's uh, been great. Unfortunately, tomorrow I will be teaching for most of the day, but I will try to, to, to join you uh, whenever possible. And if you have any questions related to IT services, to the functioning of this platform, just let, feel free to, to send me uh, a message, drop me a note. It's absolutely fine. Thank you, and see you tomorrow. <laughs> Bye. Thanks, Daria. See you tomorrow.